are you? I'm doing good. I'm I'm trying to send an invite to Audrey, but it's not coming up. Okay. It's weird. Hi. We have a visitor. <laughs> <laughs> She's so cute. Oh, there you go. She showed up now. Perfect. Hi. 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 So I guess the only experience on here is brunch with the Instagram. <laughs> No, yeah, it's a little quirky <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. Okay. How's y'all day going? Doing pretty well, pretty busy. Yeah, that's good. I just got home. And you're at, where are you at, Aubrey? Uh, I'm at Albany okay. Med, so upstate New York. Okay, so let's start. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, okay, my name is Sophia Tiberia. I'm a foreign medical graduate from Bolivia. I'm also one of the members from the communication and subcommittees of Instagram uh, for the Association of Women Surgeons. Well, today we're conducting the Takeover Monday, uh, where we have every month a different uh, specialty and we'll interview different doctors from that specialty and today we have here where I'm honored to present Dr. Grunge and Dr. Rogers where they're neurosurgeons and um, if you have any questions please feel free to put the questions below in the Q&A box and we'll answer after so before we start with the questions uh, please tell us about yourself we'll start off with Dr. Grunge please sure. where do you think School, your residency, and what are you currently doing right now? Perfect. Yeah. So I'm Betsy Grunch. I am a graduate of the University of Georgia for undergrad. I did my medical school at the Medical College of Georgia. Um, graduated in, uh, and I did my residency at Duke, excuse me, in an infolded spine fellowship. Graduated from there in 2013. Um, so I am current, I am have been in practice ever since I left my residency in Gainesville, Georgia um, at the Longstreet Clinic where I basically do general neurosurgery, but I do focus, uh, really do the majority of my practice in spine. Um, I do, uh, we're a level two trauma center, so I do a fair amount of trauma as well, including cranial stroke, that kind of stuff. And thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Rogers, Yep, great. Hi, I'm Aubrey Rogers. Um, so I actually grew up north of Seattle, and then I did my undergraduate at Brigham Young in Utah and medical school where I did a MD-MPH combined program uh, at Hofstra on Long Island. Uh, I'm now in Albany, New York for my residency at Albany Medical Center. So I am a PGY4, which means I'm about halfway done with my fourth year, um, putting me halfway done with residency as of New Year's Eve, so I'm very excited. Um, and the fourth year at my program is essentially a research year or an enfolded fellowship year, so I am doing the first of two years of an enfolded vascular fellowship, so um, focusing on endovascular, um, essentially treating the conditions of the blood vessel. Oh, um, that's amazing. Great. Okay, so... Um, Aubrey, so what inspired you to choose neurosurgery? Yeah, so, so for me, there isn't like a particular case or instance, but at my medical school, everyone on our neurology rotation, we spent a week on neurosurgery. Um, and so that was kind of my first exposure to it. Um, 
and then the background of that is that really my medical school we split down our curriculum by body systems and when we were studying neurology that was the most interesting to me it just feels like a puzzle it's so logical when the patient has symptoms you can like tease out where it's coming from and what part of the nervous mm -hmm. system it is and so I really like that like puzzle aspect of it and then combining that with surgery it's just yeah. kind of all the together. Dr. Grin I mean practice I'm sorry you cut out what did you say so many years in practice or why why did you choose neurosurgery oh. um so I um kind of always wanted to be a neurosurgeon um I was 13 when my mom was in an auto accident and uh suffered a c5 uh, spinal cord injury and so she was quadriplegic and I really just wanted to kind of uh, understand spinal cord injury and why that happened to her. So I kind of uh, started uh, y younger than most, um, kind of w shadowing my neurosurgeon as a long time ago. So the rules are very different than they are now. And so I was able to do a lot whenever I was in high school. Um, <clears throat> and then I went on to uh, undergrad, just kind of wanted to be a, be a neurosurgeon so it kind of started as a very early desire for me and just kind of grew from there so I'm happy to share all my experiences with that with you guys um with that that goes with my following question um could you share with us like the typical pathway of being a neurosurgeon and what and how can it compare to you on your doctor yeah sure, sure I'll, I'll uh answer that Aubrey is closer to that than I am so she may <laughs> to answer that um but you know the typical path is that you, at least within the united states is different for other uh countries but um you do four years undergraduate degree and then you um go on to medical school and do a four-year um, bachelor's degree or of some sort and then you um, complete your medical training at medical school so another four years and um and then match into a residency program which can be anywhere from seven to eight years and additional time if you're doing a fellowship like uh, what Aubrey is doing or um, as she mentioned as I mentioned some residency programs offer infolded fellowships where you can actually do a subspecialty during your training time during your research year which will um, kind of help you subspecialize without creating additional time and training mm. okay did I miss anything <laughs> <laughs> no that's about it um and doing a lot of like volunteer work and research and all sorts of extra stuff on the side um it's gotten right. like more competitive yeah. every single year so yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a process so, so um did you guys have a mentor before and before residency during residency um yeah we, uh, um i i did um i had my mentor i mean i guess um you know that's kind of what you call him the the surgeon that i shadowed but um he was older so i didn't really have a lot of help with like directing me in terms of educational paths so i just kind of i don't know kind of trailed on the coattails of people that i could just get to help me out um when i was in uh, medical school though I definitely had a mentor in the neurosurgery department that I kind of latched on to that really helped me like develop research because as she as Aubrey mentioned like it's really important to get to match in a neurosurgery residency that you're competitive show interest in the field have publications in the field so uh, as a freshman I just uh, or I guess a uh, MS1 uh, just really kind of initiated some uh, desire to do some research with one surgeon who really just kind of guided me through and helped me out a lot so yeah Yeah, so I decided on neurosurgery late, um, as I said, so I decided during the beginning of my MS three years, my third year of medical school, that this is what I wanted to do. Um, so that's kind of the time that I sought out mentors. Um, Dr. Shoulder was the program director uh, at Hofstra, and he was super helpful and supportive. Um, the chair, Dr. Narayan, uh, got me into a research lab, so I actually took a year off between my third and fourth years um, and did research mm -hmm. while getting my master's in public health. Um, and then when picking a residency program, I um, looked pretty heavily at trying to find some women neurosurgeon mentors. Um, and so that factored into 
where I wanted to go. Um, and so I'd say my biggest mentor right now is Dr. Paul. She is one of the endovascular attendings at my program. And so she's, she's been really oh, great. And helpful. And so um, I see the fellowship, right? The fellowship of choice. Um, so for Aubrey, um, why did you choose endovascular as a fellowship? What inspired you for that fellowship? Yeah, so um, the most common things that we're treating in endovascular are acute ischemic stroke um, and then brain bleeds either from like an aneurysm or an abnormality of the blood vessels. And with those conditions, there's just so much potential to acutely help that patient. So when someone comes in with a stroke and can't talk and can't move half of their body and you take them for a procedure and five minutes after it's over, they can do those things. Um, that's just very, very rewarding. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of, kind of. And how about you, Dr. Me. Grinch? Um, I see you also, you're, uh, you're doing your Synthes Spine Fellowship. Yes. Um, so I was interested in spinal cord injury and spine um, early on. And so I hooked up with a mentor in my residency in spine um, who is just excellent, well-rounded and trained in spine. And um, <clears throat> I um, just, I mean, I didn't have a female neurosurgery attending um, at the time when I was uh, at Duke, there was no female attending. So um, not that that's necessary. I do think it's helpful, but my um, mentor was extremely supportive, just, just such a great person um, and really just, you know, really believed in me to, um, do um, what I wanted to do in spine. And I think being a woman going into spine, it's such a, um, uh, I mean, it's less than 2%. So it's, it's just kind of a very um, male-dominated specialty. So I think really having his support and guidance and uh, just really helped me continue out through residency and doing my, um, and doing what I do now, so. That's great. So with my follow then um, what is your favorite part of your practice? Uh, for me, it's I enjoy every single day of everything I do. Um, I just really enjoy, you know, anything from talking to patients and explaining their diagnosis with them to sharing their victories and, um, and improvements and even uh, the other way around. Um, you know, whenever I'm on call and sharing um, even the death of a patient with a family, I think it's all something that <clears throat> you grow from and learn from and you really take joy in it. That sounds kind of weird. Um, but, you know, just sharing all those moments with people and really just kind of, um, I think it's all just something that's rewarding each and every way. So I know that sounds very corny, but it's really, um, mm -hmm. you don't take joy in what you do. I mean, there are some things we don't like doing. I don't like documenting, but, um, but I, I do enjoy patient care and um, yeah, so. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's what draws us to the medical field, right? Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Aubrey? What? Are, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still pretty early, so I'm still getting exposed to a lot of different things. Um, and I agree, it does. Like, it does sound kind of cheesy, but a lot of it is just really having that chance to, like, help patients and um, be with them kind of at the worst times of their life um, and mm -hmm. trying to help them through that. Um, and then just operating and doing cases mm -hmm. yes. more so than forward. <laughs> yeah. So, so what are your experiences, the best experiences and the hardships you experienced during residency for Rogers? Um, I mean, I guess one of the best experiences would just be, we did this like really cool case recently, um, where we had a young kid with, um, like meningitis, so an infection of her brain, um, and that caused the vessels in her brain to shut down. Um, and so she, uh, essentially was having a stroke, um, and couldn't move half of her body. And the mortality rate from that is extraordinarily high. And we were able to, um, come up with a way to treat that and we delivered medications directly to those blood vessels in her brain and we left a catheter in for a week um, which we've never done before and she left the hospital with no deficits um, so strength and 
It was um, just crazy, but it was really cool. And how about you, Dr. Brunch? Um, what and hardships that you encountered during your residency years? Yeah. Uh, I mean, during my residency years, um, I think it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of stress. I mean, you kind of are like trying to understand what you're doing and be a part of the team and be a part of the decision making process. But ultimately, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the work comes down to the residents. It's stressful. I mean, like you're exhausted. Um, you know, I had the luxury, I guess, of being a residency prior to the 80 hour work week. So I worked very hard and there were some weeks where I don't feel like I really exited the hospital uh, other than just to sleep. And so um, it's just so exhausting and everything sometimes seems kind of a blur. Um, and it's like you're drinking from a fire hydrant. And I think that is the way it is in, in college, you feel like sometimes the medical school, but in residency, it's like next level. So um, and it's, you know, purely that and then working on exhaustion and having expectations of of um, being both mentally and physically well, that can just be um, sometimes really question why um, you're doing it. But it's those cases like, like she mentioned that you do and then, um, and then you're like, wow, this is just really cool. I am learning stuff. I am um, becoming a better uh, a doctor. And then when you get to do stuff alone and you gain that confidence, it really just helps build it in. If it helps as you get out into practice, it's just so much better and just escalates the risk, but also the rewards so much more because they're all yours. And so it's just really uh, very cool. So, yeah, that's true. So um, how do you deal with burnout? Because I know sometimes it could be overwhelming, like you mentioned, especially having a family, children, or sometimes you like to enjoy your hobbies. Yeah, uh, it's tough. I mean, burnout is real. Um, and I think that goes with any profession. It's not just um, in neurosurgery, but um, you just kind of have to find a balance. And it's in a residency, it's like almost impossible. But um, for me, you know, it's, it's being a mom, a wife, friend, a a doctor and trying to balance all of that can be overwhelming and you know some days I feel like I'm like the best doctor in the world and some days I feel like the worst mom in the world and then vice versa and it's just all kind of a give and take and you kind of learn along the way of how to balance it and um, you know I think the biggest point is just trying to I at least take a moment at the beginning of every week and try to like set up what I'm going to accomplish like from my job from what we got to do with the kids from what we got to do as a family to what I got to do like on social media because that's something else um for me too it just um it can it can be a lot but I kind of set out goals for the half of the week and make sure that I try to um carry those out so, so you're doing an amazing job <laughs> and how about you Dr. Rogers yeah so I'm Still kind of in the worst of it right now um, so working a lot um, I think it's really important to prioritize yourself and your own mental health um, because the job is gonna like take and take and take from you um, and so you just have to really make sure that you're like trying to do all the basic things so I try to get enough sleep I try to work out um, I try to eat healthy so that means meal prepping and bringing food to the hospital and I work out at the gym at the hospital in the morning so then I can just shower at the hospital and like get more sleep by doing that. Um, so it's really, you have to find little ways every day that you can save time um, in order to yeah. be able to give yourself that time. Really true. So um, Abby, what, what were the barriers you encountered as a woman going to neurosurgery? Yeah, so... I feel like I don't think that being a woman stood in the way. Um, I, from like my childhood, I was raised to believe that I could do anything. Um, and everyone in college and medical school is very supportive. I found those mentors that were very supportive. Um, I do think that it is still kind of a boys club. Um, and that is changing. There's definitely a lot more women in neurosurgery now. Um, and so I think it's possible to find those places, but 
I will say that not every program or every department or every place is going to have that same culture. Um, and so I think there's probably more barriers at other places, but I kind of just sought out the places where, where it would be supportive okay. and it wouldn't stand in my way. How about you, Dr. Grinch? Um, I would agree with that. I think that um, where I trained at the time that I trained, it was extremely supportive. Um, I never really felt different because I was a woman. I had two other female co-residents, but like I said, no attendance is really like only around the time was about three. I mean, kind of give or take as the years went on, but um, uh, everyone was in incredibly supportive and I 100% agree with what she says is that every program is different which is why it's so important to really that's why I kind of I feel a little um, uh, biased a little bit about these interviews that are since COVID happened about doing these virtual interviews because it's so hard to get a feeling for a program without being there and really about being in you know kind of um, within the culture for at least a day or your interview day to kind of get a feeling of how you might interact um, with certain attendings, with the residents, um, because it's not just the attending, it's also all the residents and kind of the club, bros club, or however you wanna bill it. But, you know, my residents that were around me in my class were so fantastic. They were all great friends, all very supportive of each other. And you don't find that at every single program. And, you know, it's really where you feel the most, where you feel like you're gonna be the most secure in yourself and support it because if you are surrounded by people that um, don't support you then it may be a totally different experience for you so anyway mm -hmm. that's true so I see um, Dr. Grunch you're very active in media uh, please tell us more about it Inspire you to be a part of that um, I think I've just gotten at a point in my career where I um, needed something else to do, I guess. I didn't have enough to do. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, um, I really, really like to teach. I really like to talk to young people. And in my practice, I'm kind of, I'm in private practice. I don't have any students. Um, I, I love, love um, to teach and reach out to people, but, um, you know, just social media kind of feel that niche for me if you will and um and it just kind of grew from a very small place and you know i think all as providers and as 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 healthcare professionals in general social media is kind of one of those little tricky spots where it can be easily abused or misinterpreted um and so a lot many almost everybody in healthcare just avoid it altogether but if you look at like all the young minds every single person for that matter even uh, healthcare providers or on their phones and looking at content. And so, you know, I really felt like once I, I started dabbling a little bit during COVID and I was, felt like a lot of it was well received and kind of spot where it wasn't out there on social media. And so I just kind of made a commitment to myself in late 2021, uh, just kind of being consistent for like, I just told myself, let's do it for three months and just kind of see where it goes. And um, it just exploded um, from there. And I just felt like, I mean, for the most part, it was very positive and really worth it. And I uh, just kind of snowballed from now. Now it's like a, it's a freaking train off the tracks and I can't really stop now. So, um, but it's fun and I enjoy it. And there are days where I get overwhelmed and I'm like, I don't think I can do this right now. So, you know, it's just, um, I think it's it's not for everybody, but it definitely is important to have you know providers in that role um, putting stuff out there so students can learn, so other healthcare professionals can learn, and yeah. So yeah. Anyway. So, Aubrey, um, I know we're in um, interview season. Um, the majority mm -hmm. already your interviews, and some most likely have still. Um, so, what do you look for in an app? or future applicants? Yeah, so especially as one of the residents, one of the biggest things that I am looking for is a person that I want to spend like 50 to 80 hours a week with. Um, so a lot of it is kind of like a vibe check and like how well they're going to fit in because every program has like a specific culture that they've like cultured over 
over time. And every year that you bring new people into that can really shift it. And so you have to think a lot about where you want your program to be headed as far as the culture and the type of people that you have. And so that is one of the, the biggest things. Um, and then because residency is so hard and so demanding, you really want to find signs that a person um, is really committed to it and that they have the determination to follow through and put in all those hours and do the hard work because um, it's difficult for a program if you're losing residents if they don't make it through. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, I guess those are kind of the And do you have any um, like ideas where it, IMG could find some rotation or any advice during interview? Yeah, that's hard. Um, I don't know. I haven't like had that experience or a lot of exposure to that, so I don't know of any like specific. There's any like specific things set up or ways to do that. Um, I guess it's it probably kind of comes down to like a number scheme. So just really like reaching out to people um, and trying to find. Trying to find someone that will support you in that, but any advice, I don't know any advice for specific. future neurosurgeons? Um, I think just you know, mm -hmm. staying the staying the course. I mean, the training is so hard and overwhelming. But I mean, honestly, like if it was easy, then everybody would do it. And you play a role in people's life that is life changing. And um, if you aren't well trained, then you're not going to be good at your job. Um, so it is such a huge investment in your uh, time and your life for the long term. Um, and, you know, I think those that want to go into the field um, know that they want to go into the field for the right reasons. Um, and I think, you know, that's really the most, most important thing because no one can really survive the training of what is needed. Um, without really being passionate about about the field and about patient care. So, um, so yeah, and it, it seems like a really long time, but gosh, I feel like yesterday I graduated from residency and I've already been in practice for 10 years. So time goes by so fast. Yeah. Um, are there any tips for family planning as a resident? Do you guys have any tips for that? Um, I'm going to pass on that one. Um, so I uh, met my husband when I was like right at where Aubrey was. Like I was in my research year. So I just started dating. I dated like years one to three of residency and met um, my husband year three. So um, we, you know, I, I, I was in a six year program. So we got married in fifth year and then knew that we weren't going to really plan on starting a family until I was back closer to home uh, with people that could help. However, I will say that I have had um, at a co-resident, a female co-resident that was one year older than me, and she uh, came into residency, married. She started a family during residency, um, had her um, first child during residency. I think she had one or two children at, in fellowship, um, but, you know, was able to navigate it pretty well. Just you need a lot of support. Um, from your spouse, from, from family, if they're nearby or hiring help. Um, but it's just so, you know, I think times are changing where it's more, um, accepted, but, but I think, you know, asking those questions are not inappropriate during interviews because, um, I think it's so important to really know what you're getting into. And if that's something that, you know, going into residency, that that's something that you may want to do. You may want to know what the kind of the expectations of, of that during the residency training is but yeah hard it's hard at any time of your life i can't imagine what it would be like during residency yeah and um okay i have some questions that they asked with the q a um one of them is what is it like serving the community you grew up in oh it's um it's so rewarding um it it's amazing to be able to treat people that really know me from back before I um, even went to college. Um, it's, it's such a cool experience just to be able to, to be able to take care of like everybody from like, you know, 
start to finish. Um, but I will say it's also kind of um, uh, sometimes stressful to take care of people that, that you know or that know so many different people and also trying to live up to those expectations of, you know, I feel like almost everybody has my access on social media or my cell phone is tagging me like, hey, please, can you get in so-and-so? And, oh, they're in so much pain. And I kind of feel torn because, you know, I have so much work to do. Um, but I also want to, you know, be able to care for those uh, that I can. It just pulls you in a lot of different directions. Um, but I've learned how to better balance that over time um, and, and get help. Um, I think as a, as a physician coming out into practice, I mean, I try to do all that on my own uh, with one PA. And it was just too, it, it just got too overwhelming for both of us. And so I've learned how to better share the load, if you will, how to balance the load. Um, with other advanced practice providers and uh, have a fantastic team right now, just a great group of, of, um, of girls that help me just take care of patients and, and it's, it's wonderful. So it's, it's, you're only one person. That's my, that's my one thing is like, you can't, you can only give and take so much. <laughs> that's true. And for, for Rob, um, I'll agree, um, Dr. Rogers. Um, it says, what will you change back in time? Sorry, well, it says, what will, will you change going back in time? Oh, as yeah. far as like my process um, of getting into neurosurgery, I don't know. I'm one of those people that like truly just like doesn't believe in regretting any part of your life because it's like what has gotten you to where you are. Um, and I, I don't have anything specific to like this process of getting into neurosurgery as far as things that I would change because I do feel yeah. like I'm very happy where I am. Um, so I know that's like kind of a cop out and avoiding the question. Um, but I really just like, I don't that's regret <laughs> well, um, I think we're out of time here. Um, any any other advice you you guys want to mention to future neurosurgeons, residents, medical students? Uh, Dr. Rogers, I'll let you go first. <laughs> yeah, um, just it's going to be really really hard, and so if this is what you want to do. You have to really know that this is the right thing for you. Um, and if it is, be willing to work super hard and understand that there are going to be like terrible, terrible days. Um, but it's going to be so worth it. Yeah, I would, I would say the same. I mean, you know, it's so, it's, it's so hard for anybody, not just for being a woman, but, um, any female that goes into any male dominated field, you're always going to be the odd man out, so to speak. So you're always going to be judged um, based on your character and you're going to be just looked at differently. It's just reality of it. And I think being a woman in a leadership professional role, period, like you kind of have to look at your, yourself as how you may be interpreted by other people. So, for example, like, you know, um, I feel like being a woman, if I'm very assertive um, uh, to, let's say, to nurses or to other residents or whatever, that may be interpreted as being a bitch, whereas a male colleague may not have that same um, judgment. It's kind of looked at as that's the way they're supposed to, to act. Um, and so I think you're kind of looked at in a different front. And I think it's... Um, it's easy for people to look to you as a friend. Um, and, you know, you have to be very careful about your developing um, um, relationships and healthcare. And it's so, I mean, it's important that you do that, but you also have to, you know, you are, or you are the leader, you are the physician, you are the decision maker. You have to be assertive um, in order to take good care of patients. And you can't always just do what everybody um, wants you to do or act like how you want to act. And, and you may be interpreted as that, and, you know, that's okay to some extent, but you don't want, um, it's just such a fine role I feel like we play. And 
Um, and you kind of learn from things that you may have said wrong or said differently. Um, and just try to figure out, you know, in any experience, um, how can I do that better next time? And um, how can I maybe make myself seem not how I did in that type of encounter? And I think those are the kind of things that really helps you grow stronger um, uh, being in that in any, in any really profession because um, um, cause it's, it's hard. Um, but, but like she said, Dr. Rogers said, I mean, it's a long time period of your life, but I feel like it is a short period of your life, too, On the and being on the flip side and on the back end, I would absolutely do it again. I wouldn't want to do it again because I don't want to go through all that crap again, but um, all that late learning, all that training um, has got me to where I am today and has really led me to be the person that I am today, and I'm so proud of where I am. All the work that I do, I'm very proud of. And um, I'm so excited for future physicians like the two of you um, to go into this field and really change it because that's what we need um, in order to, you know, make this not as um, a weird thing for us to have this discussion, right? So it should be normal. Um, and the only way to do that is to change the face of medicine, to change the face of neurosurgery, and to grow and to make it better. So uh, welcome any people into the field. <laughs> well, that was great words. Both of you, thank you so much for your time. We you guys and also the advice you have given. I hope we answer questions in the audience also. Um, thank you. Thanks, hope guys. You have a good evening. Thanks for your time. Good, good luck, Dr. Rogers, and, and you as well.